All right. Hi, everyone. I know I say this before every guided lecture, but this one might actually be on the shorter side. Nah, it won't. This is Unit 5, Revolution in Politics. Really, we're just talking about the French Revolution. There's going to be some other stuff that surrounds the French Revolution, but primarily it's context for the French Revolution and effects of the French Revolution. Um, the French Revolution is an incredibly important event, of course, in European history. It's an important event in world history as well. We're going to talk about all the reasons why. Hopefully from freshman year, you remember some of them. We're going to get into detail, a little bit more detail than freshman year. But like last unit with the Enlightenment and the Scientific Revolution, my hope is that a lot of this is review um, for you. So uh, fingers crossed. So um, where do we begin? I, I think a good place to begin, you know, this, this unit is... The College Board defines it as 1775 to 1815. So we're talking about 40 years of time here. I'd actually go back a little before that, and I would start it in 1754, 56, or maybe even 1763, because that's the Seven Years' War, 1756 to 1763. And the Seven Years' War is a really cataclysmic event in European history. In this country, in the United States, we remember it as the French and Indian War, and it's kind of a minor thing. It's it's setting up the American Revolution. There's It's pretext for the American Revolution in many ways. Um, but it's not one of the wars we talk about often. It's just a prelude to a more important war, air quotes around that. The French and Indian War, it becomes subsumed into the Seven Years' War. It becomes a part of this, really the first global war, as I put over there in the caption to the picture. It is being fought by all the major European powers. You see there are Great Britain, Prussia, and Portugal who are aligned against France, Spain, Austria, Russia, and Sweden. The big ones there are Great Britain and France. Uh, Spain is, is probably 1B on our tiers. Great Britain and France are 1A. Britain, Britain's going to win this war, um, and they're going to win this war at the expense of both France and Spain. Uh, Spain has been on the outs for a while. This war is going to solidify the fact that Spain is not one of the great powers anymore in Europe. But it's also going to solidify the fact that Britain is the most powerful country in Europe, at least for a, for a short time. Napoleon's going to flip that around again in the early 1800s. But for a short time after 1763, Britain is going to be um, the most powerful country in Europe, uh, without a doubt. France and Spain are both severely weakened by the war. The Seven Years' War is going to destroy the old system, what's referred to as the old system of alliances in Europe. And we don't need to be too concerned about what the old system was. It gets into a lot of detail that is even unnecessary for a survey course like AP Euro. The significance for us is that the destruction of the old system means that there is no longer a balance of power in Europe. And what we're going to see between 1763 and really 1815 with the Congress of Vienna is an attempt by the great powers of Europe to figure out a new balance of power. And they're not really going to be successful until we get to the Congress uh, of Vienna. Why is that? Well, there's a lot of reasons, but one of the primary ones is that almost all of these countries are having major internal problems, most of them economic. And that's really where we start our story about France and the French Revolution. So on the eve of the French Revolution, really about 25 years before it, but the map's not going to change too much. This is what the map of Europe looks like. It's starting to get pretty similar. There's a lot of similarities to the current map of Europe, especially if we're looking in Western Europe. Italy and Germany still got some stuff to figure out, but uh, for the most part, it's starting to look pretty normal. So oh, the Ancien Regime in France is where we will begin our story with a little contextualization. So we have a three estates system of social classes in France. There are two privileged estates and there is one that is very not privileged and that's what this political cartoon is lampooning. The first two estates are the nobility and the clergy. And these two estates um, provided 2% of its income, um, the clergy pay almost no taxes, and so most of the French economy is going to fall to the third estate. Um, the other problem, as far as the third estate is concerned, is that the first two estates, the nobility and the clergy, each get one vote in the estates general when the estates general is called, and the third estate also gets one vote. So here you have this system where 97% of the people in France 
who are also paying almost all of the French um, budget in the form of taxes are really being um, asked to shoulder the burden of the nobility and the clergy. Within the third estate, we have um, a further breakdown of the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie is a term you're going to hear a lot in this PowerPoint, but also moving forward in AP Euro. The bourgeoisie you can think of as, um, oh gosh, upper middle class. You know, they're, they're really upper middle class to upper class, but these are people who do not have titles, so they're not nobles, um, they're not aristocrats, but they are um, wealthy, um, fairly well off to just like straight up wealthy. And they are beginning to take more power or want to take more power for themselves. They see themselves as upwardly mobile. And then you have um, the, the workers, um, urban workers and rural workers. And they all are lumped into the third estate. Um, what happens here is that we have this confluence of events. So we have enlightenment ideas, which of course we've already talked about. They are inspiring the third estate to take more power for themselves. Think about the ideas of equality, liberty, democracy. It's very intriguing to a group that feels it has been disenfranchised, not just by the monarchy, but also by the other two estates, by the nobility and by the clergy. You, you, you can start to see already how the French Revolution is going to become more revolutionary than the American Revolution, because the third estate is going to look at essentially the pillars of French society as things that need to be destroyed. The American Revolution was never about that. The American Revolution was never about destroying the pillars of um, American colonial society. It was really just about replacing the British monarchy with our own version of monarchy. Now, obviously, the Constitution changes those things around a little bit, but I always look at it as the in the American Revolution, it's really just like a bunch of wealthy white men um, replacing another group of wealthy white men. That's somewhat of what's happening in the French Revolution. Many of the bourgeoisie are themselves quite wealthy, um, but they really want to take down um, groups that are not even targeted in the American Revolution um, at all. And so that's, that's a big difference between the French Revolution and the American Revolution that we're going to see. Another big difference is that the French, I don't want to make this a comparative um, PowerPoint, but the, the French Revolution is um, also coming at a time of great economic turmoil for France, and that is not the case in um, the American colonies. So there are very high taxes in France. These high taxes are brought about by the Seven Years' War, and also France helping the American patriots against the British in the um, American uh, Revolutionary War. Um, and the lifestyle of King Louis the Sixteenth and his wife Marie Antoinette, who are living quite a lavish lifestyle. The, you think about what the, the Palace of Versailles represented to the French people in the 17th century. It represented the prestige of France. It represented the richness and greatness of France. Well, you fast forward 150 years, and now all of a sudden Versailles represents extravagance, and Versailles represents the elite secluding themselves from the problems of the rest of France. You know, when times are good, the Palace of Versailles is something to be celebrated. But now that, that times are bad, the palace is something to be derided and ultimately destroyed. It comes to represent the excesses of the French system. Louis XVI himself is a very weak leader. He takes over for his grandfather, Louis XV, when he is, um, his, his grand, Louis XV dies in 1774. And uh, Louis is pretty ill-prepared for the throne. He's 20 years old. He's uh, fairly... Um, fairly young. Um, and despite the fact that he has been bred his entire life and raised his entire life to be the king of France, he's not really prepared for it. Um, he doesn't really want to um, rule France. He's not interested in the day-to-day -day intricacies of ruling the country. And so he's just, he's just not prepared. He's just not a good king um, and a strong leader at a time when that's what France needs. The Estates General is called in 1789. The king needs to call the Estates General in the hopes that they will approve a new tax um, on the nobility because he needs money, he needs revenue. And not surprisingly, the first two estates, the clergy and the nobility, um, say that no, and they have two of the three votes in the Estates General. And so now all of a sudden we have a crisis. 
And this crisis is going to lead to a really extraordinary event in European history, um, which is the tennis court oath and the foundation, uh, the, the founding of the National Assembly. So the members of the third estate show up to one of the meetings of the estates general and they find themselves locked out. And so for them, this is the final straw. Many of the members of the third estate had already been upset at um, their disenfranchisement. They, they move next door um, to a, uh, a tennis court, what was, what was then called a tennis court, but I think it was more like, uh, like, like squash or something. Um, and they take this oath to um, continue to meet in perpetuity until a new constitution and a new government um, of France is created. And this is the National Assembly. This is the moment when the National Assembly is, is born. The National Assembly doesn't have a lot of teeth to it, of course. It's not the legitimate government of France, but what happens very quickly is that the people of France throw their weight behind the National Assembly and they support the National Assembly against the monarchy. Um, one of the seminal events in the, the French Revolution, or what will be, become the French Revolution, is the storming of the Bastille, um, or the Bastille, storming of the Bastille, which is this old medieval prison that is in the center of Paris. And it comes to represent, like the Palace of Versailles, but uh, much darker, it comes to represent the problems with the old order. Um, this prison had housed many uh, criminals, obviously, but it also housed people who were political prisoners and who um, some believed were unjust, uh, unjustifiably imprisoned by the French government. And so the Bastille is stormed um, on July 14th, 1789 by a mob. The mob demands to be let in um, and eventually they uh, make their way in. But what becomes really significant um, is that um, the way that the mob acts is incredibly violent. They um, rip through the Bastille and they kill all of the guards. And not only do they kill the guards, but they kill the guards in very savage ways. They cut off the heads of the guards um, after they have been brutally murdered, put them on the ends of pikes, and march around the streets of Paris. Um, so now you have this situation where the representation of the old order has been destroyed, and it has been done so in a very violent way. And the members of the National Assembly do not condemn this. They do not condemn this act. They do not condemn the way that the act is carried out. And this is going to set up instances of future violence, which is what we're going to see from the French Revolution. One of the things that sets the French Revolution apart from the American Revolution, which is the, I keep comparing them and I should take a step back and say, one of the reasons why I'm doing that is because these are the first two revolutions that are drawing upon the Enlightenment as their backing, as the justification. And so you have the American Revolution, which um, is somewhat supported by some of the conservatives in Europe, like Edmund Burke, who your textbook is going to, to talk about. The American Revolution is fairly orderly by contrast to the French Revolution. And so what we're going to see is that the French Revolution takes this much more radical, much more radical direction. You never see things like um, the heads of uh, British soldiers being paraded around in the streets on pikes. And certainly if you did have instances of unmitigated violence, which of course the American Revolution did, those things were not celebrated um, if they weren't even outright condemned. And so this is an important moment in the, the French Revolution. Bas the storming of the Bastille is also an important moment in um, French history. This is basically like, you know, the French 4th of July. July 14th is Bastille Day, which is a um, uh, French national holiday. Also, what's going to occur over the, the coming months is that the, um, the people of Paris actually tear down the Bastille. So if you go to, to Paris today hoping to see the, the Bastille, you're not going to see it. There's like a pole <laughs> where it used to be um, because they actually tore this thing down brick by brick really with their bare hands. This is a painstaking process, um, the, the tearing down of the Bastille. And so from here, the revolution really spirals out of control. There's rumors, um, the rumors that led to the storming of the Bastille, that Louis was sending um, troops to put down, put down the, um, the revolution. And rumors are now beginning to spread across the French countryside that the, the wealthy, um, 
that the nobility, but also the bourgeoisie, are going to try to starve out, uh, basically kill off the peasants, and that the aristocrats are going to like they're they're trying to create a completely a, a, a complete new France, and in, in a part of that they're actually going to try to kill off the peasants. This is not true. This rumor is not true, but. The French Revolution is all about rumors. There's so many rumors that are flying around throughout 1789 through 1794, really. And this leads to something which historians call the Great Fear, which turns peasants into outlaws as they seek to destroy the aristocracy before the aristocracy can destroy them. That's the way they they view it. So they set about destroying legal papers, really trying to tear down the French government, right? Tear down the aristocracy, um, because if the peasants can tear down the aristocracy, they won't be under threat. In some cases, manor houses are burned down, which is what you, you see going on over here. Again, this is like this cycle of violence as things get more and more revolutionary, as things get more and more violent. There are people within the revolutionary apparatus, Maximilien Robespierre is going to be the most famous of these, who are cheering this on, who see this as as, as a positive development. This is um, something that we see in, in revolutions across time. The Russian Revolution of 1917 is, a, is another good example of this. Um, and uh, there are people who believe that in order to have a true revolution, you really need to tear down society and completely rebuild it. And so when you have these riots that break out, another instance are um, these women in, um, uh, in, in Paris who are rioting over bread prices, um, demanding that the king and queen come to Paris. Um, they uh, storm the Palace of Versailles at one point. I mean, it, it looks like they're just going to, um, if they find Louis XVI or Marie Antoinette, they're just going to tear them apart. Um, and so it's just getting more and more radical here. Um, and so what we're seeing is the end of, of the French monarchy, which is coming to be. Now, so we have this, this violent radicalism that is happening, but we also have the Enlightenment um, portion of this. The Enlightenment, of course, is the justification for the French Revolution. So the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen is one of the great documents to come out of the French Revolution. It's you know, as Americans, we would be um, remiss in, um, nope, that's the wrong word. We would be fooled, <laughs> it's a simpler word, fooled into um, making a connection between this and the Declaration of Independence. That's not the right connection to make. The Bill of Rights is probably a better one um, to make because the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen is going to codify, meaning set into law, the rights of all French men air quotes around all, of course, liberty, equality, fraternity, very similar to the, the American Bill of Rights. Uh, other major reforms that are attempted, getting rid of the Catholic Church and the power of the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church, their lands are seized and distributed. Um, political independence is claimed by um, the French National Assembly. And so the they set about seizing these lands and selling them off to finance um, the revolution and the wars of the re revolution, which we'll talk about um, in a moment. It's at this point that Louis and Marie see the writing on the wall and believe that the revolution is becoming so radical that they really need to, they need to leave. Um, they need to escape because if they don't, they're probably going to, to die. They're going to be killed. And so they attempt to flee to Austria, which is where Marie Antoinette is from. And um, they are caught. Uh, apprehended at the border by a border guard who recognizes them. They are brought back to Paris where they will live um, for the rest of their lives until they are, until they are killed. So the question is once you, once they are caught, what to do with them? Um, should they be allowed to live in prison for the rest of their lives as prisoners of the state or should they um, be killed? And there's these two groups um, who emerge within the Jacobins. The Jacobins is this political group that rises to control the National Assembly, and they are the moderates and the radicals. The moderates are the Giardin, the radicals are the, I'm not even going to try to say that one. <laughs> Your textbook refers to them as the mountain, which is good enough for me. Uh, Maltenia? No, that's totally wrong. Um, and so you have the moderates who say, well, you know, let's, 
let's not kill the king and queen. They can just live in prison. It's it's fine. You know, what are we really trying to do here? Um, let's keep our eyes on the prize and the radicals who are going to be led by Robespierre say, you know, we, we need to kill the king. If, if, you, if you do not kill the king, um, then it's possible that the king can rally support. And so you need to kill the king in order for the revolution to continue and to really reinvent French society and political, the political apparatus. And so the, the king is executed in January of 1793. And it's at this point that the vi- violence really begins to spiral out of control. Robespierre assumes um, control of the National Assembly, which he rules through a committee called the Committee of Public Safety, uh, aptly named. Um, he rules essentially as a dictator. The justification here from Robespierre is that the revolution has many, many enemies. He is paranoid. Robespierre is incredibly paranoid. Um, and he, he justifies the violence of the terror by saying that the, the revolution needs to kill the people who are against it, or at least round them up, but eventually kill the people who are against it so that it may continue. That if you let these, well, they're traitors. If you let these traitors continue to live within France, then the revolution is under threat. And so thousands are executed during the reign of terror. Um, and eventually Robespierre himself is executed. He Robespierre's primary tactic, or one of his primary tactics that he would use, was that he would go in front of the National Assembly and say, I have a list of uh, a, a list of traitors here, and um, we're going to take care of them. And then he would round up however many people he needed to round up. But he makes this fateful error as the violence really spirals out of control and goes in front of the Assembly and says, I have a list of, um, of people, um, but he doesn't actually produce a list this time. There's, there's no names that he produces. And so now all of a sudden everybody um, is a potential target for Robespierre. And so they, they pan together and think, well, why don't we kill this guy before he kills us? Um, and so Robespierre is executed in July of 1794, which really leads to the Thermidorian reaction. Thermidor was the month of July in the revolutionary calendar, because one of the things that the French revolution does is if you're going to completely try to reinvent society, you really need to tear out the roots of old society. And that means uh, a new religion, you know, no more Christianity, a new calendar, um, because the calendar is based on Christian calendar, of course. Um, they try to do a 10-day week, because if you don't have a 7-day week, no one will remember what day Sunday was, and then you can't have... Christian worship, you know, they do these really radical things. And so the Thermidorian reaction is an attempt to get the revolution back to its 1789 roots. Um, It's a reaction against the terror and the radicalism. And that's uh, eventually going to give way to the directory, which is going to rule France for um, about five years um, until Napoleon um, and until Napoleon Bonaparte um, takes control. Uh, Napoleon is one of those figures in history who is enigmatic. He's very difficult to figure out. He is a supporter of the revolution at at first, and he is very much a hero in France. He rises through the ranks of the French military incredibly quickly. He becomes a general at 24 years old. Um, He fights in Austria, Italy, Egypt, um, defending the armies of the French Revolution. He wins virtually every battle that he leads, and he becomes a national celebrity. And in 1799, he returns to France from Egypt, and he orchestrates a coup d'etat. He overthrows the directory, and uh, he is installed as the first consul, um, which we have immortalized here in this incredibly dramatic portrayal of Napoleon standing resolute uh, in the middle of the directors, and he is named first consul. And Napoleon sets about attempting to restore order and stabilize the economy and the government, as well as ending the wars of expansion. He signs what's referred to as the Concordat, with the Pope, who is uh, Pope Pius VII at that time, which recognizes the church and the legitimacy of the church 
in France, but it completely separates out the Catholic Church from French governmental affairs. What you see here is Napoleon is he's trying to do what the Directory and the Thermidorian reaction attempted to do, which is to go back to a time of stability. He's trying to restabilize France while also keeping some of the revolutionary elements in French government and French society. The Napoleonic Code is a great representation of this. He creates these laws that um, have some rights in them, but also take away some of the more radical rights as well. Um, some of the rights that women had gained throughout the 1790s, for example, are going to be stripped away during this. And so that's why Napoleon, I say he's enigmatic, because you can look at him as a defender of many aspects of the French Revolution. He's codifying, meaning putting, putting into law a lot of the moderate parts of the revolution. But you can also look at Napoleon as a dictator or a despot, as someone who is trying to take power for himself, who does take power for himself, and who is not as revolutionary as many of the leaders of the French Revolution was. And so his legacy is one of those things that historians have, some historians have devoted their lives to trying to piece, to to piece together because he is a really fascinating figure. He is crowned emperor for life in 1804. He is wi wildly popular at this point with the French people because what Napoleon has done is he's stabilized France he has restored a lot of the French power and restored France to a country that is to be feared and respected in Europe. Um, and so the French people love him. He's okay. Emperor for life. Sure. Things are going much better than they were 10 years ago, uh, back during the terror when we had guillotines all throughout French cities and people were getting their heads cut off every day. Um, what Napoleon does, however, is he overstretches himself. Um, Napoleon is one of the most ambitious people really to have ever lived in, um, in modern Europe and modern European politics. He uh, attempts to conquer all of Europe. Um, he really attempts to rebuild this great French empire and to make it greater than it had ever been. Um, and so what we see is that Napoleon is not going to try to build a global empire so much. He's going to cut ties with um, the French colony of St. Dominique, which becomes Haiti. He's going to sell the Louisiana territory, of course, to the United States. And instead, what he is going to set about trying to do is to conquer Europe, to build this great continental empire, which we see here on, on this map. This is 1812. This is really at the height of Napoleon's Napoleon's power here. Um, but in, in doing so, he really stretches himself too thin. Um, he institutes the continental system, which the continental system is his attempt to destroy the British empire by not allowing British ships, merchant ships to dock at French or French controlled ports, which you can see by 1812 is a whole heck of a lot um, of Europe. So you can see how Napoleon represents this existential threat to the British Empire, which explains why the British are so strongly against him and um, willing to fight against him. But what really, <clears throat> excuse me, does him in is his disastrous invasion of Russia, which is the stuff of legend. He invades Russia in the summer of 1812, famously um, not prepared for a winter war. He doesn't think that this invasion is going to drag on, and it does. It drags on into the winter of 1812, and the French army is decimated, completely decimated. Um, the English take advantage of this weakened Napoleonic army and situation. Napoleon tries to raise a new army, but uh, France's enemies, which are Prussia, Russia, and Britain, um, banish Napoleon. They, they take over um, France. They invade France, make it to Paris, um, and they banish Napoleon to uh, Elba, the island of, of Elba. But Napoleon escapes. He escapes Elba in 1814, and he famously uh, rides through the French countryside on the way back to Paris and raises an army on the way. He was still wildly popular, despite the disastrous invasion of Russia. So he returns in, to power in 1815 for 100 days 
Um, but he is ultimately and finally defeated at the Battle of Waterloo in 1815. He is exiled once again to an island that is farther out, and um, he is not given the means to escape, and he, is, uh, he lives out the rest of his life in St. Helena, where he dies in 1821 in obscurity um, six years later. So this is the end of Napoleon's story, but it's not the end of the French revolutionary story because now that France has been weakened, the victorious powers, the great powers of Europe need to make sure that France cannot do what it has just done multiple times, which is upset the balance of power. They need to recreate that balance of power that was destroyed by the old system in the Seven Years' War and really destroyed by the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars. So the Congress of Vienna is called to create this stability in Europe. The five great powers now, Russia, Prussia, Austria, Great Britain, and France, need to create this new system. And the leader of the Congress of Vienna, the most influential of the state ministers, is going to be this man pictured here on your screen, Clemens von Metternich. And he has three goals um, for the Congress First and most pressing is to prevent future French aggression. That one should be pretty clear as to why. Second, a long-term goal is to restore the balance of power, which I already talked about. And how is that going to be done? Well, Metternich is a conservative, small c. Uh, and so to him, the way that that is going to be done is by restoring the monarch's rightful heirs to the thrones all across Europe, because what had happened was that um, Napoleon had removed them all. He had removed them all and replaced them with members of his family. He had replaced them with his allies. And um, Metternich says, if we want a balance of power, we need to roll back the clock to before 1789. Um, small c conservative. We, we need to roll things back. Small evolutionary change is the way to be. And so the Congress of Vienna in 1815 um, is another one of those demarcation points in European history. It decreases France's power really forever. Um, France is going to be a shadow of itself from here on out. Um, France will still be powerful, but never like it was under Napoleon. Britain and Prussia, both of their power um, bases increase. Britain, much more so than Prussia, although Prussia is going to be uh, in, an incredibly powerful continental power. Um, the other thing is that this new balance of power is successful, and it's going to last for about 100 years. It's going to last really until World War I destroys it. Um, there's going to be wars within the 19th century in Europe, but these wars are localized, regionalized. They do not destroy this balance of power in the same way that the Napoleonic Wars did. Okay, last slide here. So um, the legacies of this entire unit or time period, 1763 up through 1815, revolutions are going to continue to occur throughout Europe and throughout the world. If we just look at France, there are multiple uprisings that are going to occur throughout the 19th century. Think about like Les Miserables, Les Miserables. A lot of people mistakenly believe that that's based on the French Revolution. It's not. It's just based on one of these random student uprisings that takes place in, in France in the, I don't remember exactly when it was, 1820s or 1830s. Um, and this is true of, uh, of elsewhere. Um, outside of Europe, of course, um, Haiti, we already talked about, St. Dominique. Latin American revolutions, early 19th century, all of Latin America, all. The majority of Latin America is going to be um, freed from Spain. Uh, the Spanish crown had been greatly weakened by Napoleon. And um, Latin American revolutionaries in the early 19th century are going to take advantage of this. So the spread of revolutions is certainly a legacy of the French Revolution. The spread of nationalism, which is closely linked to the spread of revolutions. Um, when we look at the spread of nationalism throughout Europe, and we will look at this as we 
go through the curriculum. Greece, Belgium, Italy, Germany. Um, nationalism is this force that is unleashed by the French Revolution, and it's never been bottled up. Nationalism is still an incredibly powerful force in European politics. Um, romanticism, you know, your textbook talks about romanticism. Romanticism emerges as a challenge to the Enlightenment, actually, and um, an, a challenge to the rationalism of the Enlightenment. You, you can, I mean, you could view romanticism as uh, an addendum to the Enlightenment, as an attempt to, like, amend what people like uh, Robespierre um, and uh, Rousseau even emphasized um, in the, the latter parts of the Enlightenment that the the Enlightenment is not complete without the emotions, and so Enlightenment rationalism and rational thought is it's it's missing something. It's missing this final piece, um, and so that's Romanticism, um, which is going to be nineteenth uh, century Europe. Massive social change, of course. Structures that had existed for centuries, nobility, the church, the monarchy, are now fair game for revolutionaries across 19th um, and 20th century Europe. This, I mean, this goes back to the Reformation and the Renaissance. It's, it's just becoming more and more prevalent. Um, it's just becoming more and more justified. And so that's the, the French Revolution there. And the emergence of the bourgeoisie as a political force. Um, as well. Um, you know, attempts to build upon the French Revolution um, by members of the bourgeoisie, attempts to continue the French Revolution where the French Revolution failed. Um, you know, uh, Marxism, you know, communism, and these sorts of things that you can trace a direct line back to the French Revolution. So it's, it's just this massively important moment in European political, social, economic life, but also um, the world, world history. All right, that's it. Hey, you know, not too bad, 37 minutes. Okay, okay, not, not one of the longest. Um, that's it for Unit 5.